gonna stick for me? Hey everybody, welcome to Framing Day. Just kidding, we've been doing this for a month. I'm Corbett, in case you don't know, this is my own family's house. I am the builder and GC on this. I have experts consulting with us all along the way, and one of the first that I'd like to mention when we're talking about framing is structural engineer. So here's building plans. You need these, obviously. The details that the structural engineer gave me include specifications for how many nails, what size nails, how deep they need to be embedded into things. All that stuff is very, very important if you want to know that you're building a house that is as safe as it needs to be and not ridiculously more safe than it needs to be, which means you use a lot more material, you have less room for insulation, stuff like that. We're going to talk about that today. So the short of it is, in framing this big house, I'm learning a lot of things that are very interesting to uh, why builders do things the way that they do. And there's a bunch of little tips and tricks that are interesting for high performance framing. So in order to practice with this, instead of framing up a house as practice, I went ahead and built one in virtual reality. This is our house built in 3D. And I use a, a 3D uh, software that's free. It's called SketchUp. But I have literally framed this house without cutting a single piece of wood, without wasting a bunch of stuff. When I get it wrong, I can go back in, recut it, reconfigure it to meet my specifications from the structural engineer and know exactly how everything needs to be done. Now I can even go so far as to come in here and find out exactly how long a piece of wood needs to be, right? So it'll tell me eight foot three and three eighths inches. And now I write that down on my cut list. Every single cut on this house was computer generated. We did not do anything where we laid out a wall and then cut a chalk line across it and then marked where we we're gonna do. We literally came up with the entire cut list from a computer. That is something that you can't do in the 1800s, 1900s. We have the ability to do that, we should be doing that. Most people don't have a framing plan. I wanted one because as you know, and maybe you don't, I'm not a good builder. I am a builder, but I'm not a great builder. So scheduling, budgeting, figuring out exactly how all the stuff needs to go in, that's all stuff that I'm having to learn on the job just like a new builder would. Part of the reason this is so important is that the structural engineer gives you this. This is called redlined plans. What a structural engineer essentially has done is calculate the weight of every single thing in the house and then figure out how strong the house needs to be, every single little bit and piece, in order to make it stand together for a really long time. They wrote in red ink all over the plans. And my job as the builder, as any builder would, is to go through literally every single thing on here and incorporate it into the framing plan. I can't do that unless I can practice with it and know exactly how it's all supposed to go together. So another job is foreseeing down the line. You're gonna install sheathing, we're gonna install electrical, we're gonna install air conditioning ducts, all that stuff we can predict by doing it first and seeing what the problems are gonna be if you actually do this work. So I can put the sheathing in here and then see if all of the seams of the sheathing fall onto the middle of a stud so that I have an easy job of attaching it. And in some cases, I'm gonna find that, oh, I missed one, and the seam is gonna be right down in between two studs. That means that later I'm gonna have to go along and install another piece of wood. Might as well do that at the get-go. And there are some cases where we're moving along and I realize that I made a mistake. And in fact, that is one of the keys of this channel is that everybody makes mistakes. Everything in performance is predicting and preventing mistakes from happening. And we know that they happen, so let's just make sure that we see them out front before they get there. What you're gonna see in here is framing for performance in mind. And performance, just in case you're not familiar with the rest of this channel, is the control over physics and chemistry inside of our living spaces. So before I start the tour of the big house here, let me tell you about the tiny lab and the differences between these two. First of all, a tiny house on wheels is not the same as a big house on the ground on a foundation. And we learned that in the dirt uh, experience here. So if you haven't seen those videos, go ahead and go back through the playlist of the Atlanta homestead. But the tiny lab playlist is over 60 videos. And in that, because it was so small, we got to do a lot of things that were kind of unconventional without having to worry about meeting convention because frankly, that's kind of a spaceship. So we were limited by things like the width of it on the road. It can only be eight and a half feet wide. It could only be 13 and a half feet tall. So there were all kinds of limitations that we had to work under. And knowing that we were going to take it around to every climate zone in the country, we had to really take the insulation and the framing spacing and all that stuff really anally seriously. It was 
a little bit um, bothersome to have to worry so much about everything. Should we do a single top plate or a double top plate? We're going to talk about all this stuff in just a second. Um, so I'd like to start the tour here in the big house in the easiest room to understand, which is the studio. Come with me. This is our music and dance studio. It is very simple to understand because it has no windows. So the walls are very beautiful and perfect to look at. What you can see is a bottom plate that is a two by six. The studs, which are sitting on top of the bottom plate, and they are topped with another top plate. We have the back of the Georgia Pacific force field sheathing. This is an all-in-one weather resistant barrier. At the top, you can see the blocks that are there partially to make sure that you know that all of your lumber is straight because it has a tendency to twist when it sits out here in the wind and the sun and the rain. And you want that to remain straight so that you can know when you're nailing and later drilling through our insulation, our rain screen, that we're able to hit studs. We know exactly where the stud is even though we can't see it. That also is really handy because you can use these uh, panel carriers that I don't happen to have one of on me, but you can set the sheathing up on the blocks using these things to suspend that sheet of OSB because the ground is four feet down outside. So holding it up would be a big pain in the butt. So we're able to suspend if you've got the blocks in there already. That kind of makes it easier for a small crew like me uh, and my parents to be able to do this. One of the things you're going to need to consider when you're really trying to control uh, the building process is whether you are making the framing efficient as possible or making the sheathing as efficient as possible. If you're using continuous sheathing, which almost any high performance build will, then I don't like cutting sheets of OSB. That's not as much fun as cutting uh, lumber. Cutting lumber is very easy. You just use a saw. It's literally two seconds. You don't have to set up and make it a nice straight line and blah, blah, blah. This wall is 36 feet long and that wall is 24 feet long. That is evenly divisible by four and eight, which is how OSB sheets are put on. Now also you'll see the bracing, which is why it's really important to wear a hard hat when you're inside. At this stage in the build, we have lots of stuff for you to knock your head on. It only takes one hard knock to really ruin your day, your week, potentially your month. I actually have a little uh, philosophy that people who don't take safety seriously can't take performance seriously because performance is all about knowing that you're going to make mistakes and knowing that we need to predict and prevent for them. And that is what this piece of equipment does. If I put this on, I don't have to worry about giving myself a concussion. When I was trained as an Energy Star certifier for homes, this is called a HERS Rater, Home Energy Rating System, I was taught to inspect the amount of wood in walls and to give people dings on their points for putting too many pieces of wood in a wall. I was not taught how to frame a wall or how wall framing works. So I was not very well qualified and I think that a lot of people out there might be wanting a training like that as well. So I'll just say exterior insulation is going to save the day every time. You do not have to be anal about how much wood you put in a wall if you are using exterior insulation. So I'd say in general if you're trying to build a performance controlled house, you must be using exterior insulation because all of this stuff becomes a lot simpler and easier and you're not going to have as many fights. So as you come this way, you'll see on the ground, right now I'm standing inside the master suite, master bedroom, master closet, master bathroom. There are walls outlined. This is the bottom plate and the top plate of all of my interior walls already laid out. This is going to be giving me the ability, number one, to see how the space is feeling. And if you are a homeowner who's hiring a builder to, to build for you, you need to come out here on a regular basis, like daily or at least a couple times a week, because you can feel this space and you can say, you know what? I don't like this. Let's make it bigger. Now is easy to do all that. You're going to make changes. And what the builders hate is when you come out when they're just finished something and it's done. And you say, oh, you know what? I wish that window was. And that now becomes a real pain. But we've got the bottom plate and the top plate down so that we can mark them while they're down on the ground with some of the tools that I've got on my person. I just want to give you a tour of some of the tools that I'm wearing. Having stuff on you is very useful because you don't want to be walking all over the place. This is called skill saw. It's a little bit more intense than a circular saw. It's not as good for cutting. You'll see on some videos, I did, people cutting lumber, studs, with one of these and it's really hard to make a square top 
on the thing. So we don't really use that for that purpose. We cut tops and bottom plates with that don't need to be perfectly square on the ends. But as far as any studs in here, you'll have them cut with a table saw or a chop saw. A level, very important, a nice long one. You've got a couple different kinds of squares. Really big square, very important because the longer you have this thing, the more it'll tell you about how square you are. I also have a little square. I also have a universal square. This is what we mark all of those top and bottom plates. Here you've got a top and bottom plate together. Here you've got just one thickness. And you can make nice square edges so that you know that your studs are not twisted on the bottom plate or the top plate. We also have pry bars, we've got safety glasses, we've got ear protectors, we've got gloves, we've got small levels, we have extra nails, we've got oil to uh, lubricate your nail guns, we've got pencils, we've got plans, we've got hammers, we've got drills. This is all standard stuff. Any rough carpenter knows all of this stuff. But it, as somebody who's learning how to do this in the field from my carpenter neighbor and from other experts that I'm hiring, it's been really interesting to see like, oh, this is what people are working with. And this is why builders don't like doing the performance stuff. Now, on the flip side, there is such a thing as squaring a wall perfectly. What you do is we've got this wall, for example, down on the ground and we're framing it up. And what you see here is called a brace. This is what you attach when you're sure that you have the perfect distance between the corners of a wall. So all you have to do is you take a wall and let's say it's this, you draw the corners, which means you attach it here. It doesn't matter what this dimension is as long as it is the same as this. And it is totally possible to get this to be exactly right within a 16th or a 32nd of an inch correct. There are a lot of builders who will make fun of somebody for not really taking the time to square things properly. And ironically, I think a lot of those people are also the same ones who will say, oh, it's a building. It's impossible to make the performance perfect. I happen to know that you can dial in the air tightness and the insulation layers and the HVAC to make it perfect, just like squaring a wall. It's literally no different. So that's just one of the things that I have noticed is that anything to really get it right takes time and effort. And if you put it in, you can get whatever result out of it you want. This is the entry. And this is a wall that separates the studio where we started from the rest of our living space. You can see that there's two two by four top and bottom plates here. This is going to be a double wall. Each one of these will be insulated and they are offset by three quarters of an inch. That offset is really important. That's the difference, by the way, between acoustical insulation and thermal insulation, it's exactly the same thing, except the acoustical insulation is a little thinner. It, it will have an air gap built in, so it'll only be three inches deep instead of three and a half inches deep. That gives you another thing for the sound to go through. So we're building ours in, and that way we can use thermal insulation everywhere. That's kind of handy. When you come into the house, one of the things that immediately becomes apparent when you start framing or building it in your 3D modeling software is that if I want my door to be in the perfect place in the wall visually, I'm going to have to add more wood. So you can see that this is not a 16 inch on center cavity. This is not a 16 inch on center cavity. When I was framing the tiny lab, I tried to put all my windows and doors inside of the cavity. So I would have put the door here because that way I only interrupt one stud. Now that we're building a real house and we want to have the windows exactly where we want them, which in this case, I walk in my front door and I want to have a window directly ahead of me. All that stuff means if you want to make it look really good, you're going to have to mess around with your framing and not have it framed perfectly. There is a concept in framing called advanced framing. And one of the concepts of advanced framing is that you try to stack everything and make it as efficient as possible, which in some ways starts driving you crazy. You can see here, we have a single top plate. The top plate is what is on top. Double top plate is a lot easier because you give yourself the flexibility to not have to worry about putting all my studs in the upper floors directly over this stud. If I need to move them a little bit, that's okay. That's what you want, is just to have the process be as fluid and as adaptable as possible. Flexibility, very important at this stage, in my opinion. So we put a double top plate on here because a single top plate is dumb. You don't want to do that. It's going to make you overly anal and make your life horrible. When we move through here, you can see this is a two by four wall. We switched over from two by six to two by four. And here we step into our living space. Those three windows 
used to be exactly the same. They were like the middle window. But my bride came in and stood in her kitchen and said, I'm not tall enough to see where the girls are going to be playing on their playground from the kitchen while I'm cooking. Stop. Move the windows. We make them either lower or we just expand them to another foot down, which is what we ended up doing. Now, the last thing I'll just mention as far as the structural stuff goes is that you've got two kinds of walls. There's through walls and butt walls. A through wall is one that is along the load-bearing axis. So our roof joists are going to go like this, which means that the walls that those are sitting on, not the ones that are parallel with the roof joists, but the ones that intersect them, are the ones that are going to carry a lot of the weight. So this one, any wall that runs this way in my house, is a through wall. That's a load-bearing wall. I need to take those really seriously. Anything that is coming in and intersecting with a through wall butts into it. So you can see this one goes all the way from there, and it goes to the outside edge of my building. Then this is a butt wall, and it comes right in here. This stud in a 2 by 4 wall is technically more wood, which is going to take away from my insulation that, again, I want to fill as much of the house as possible. But number one, structural engineer told me I need two studs at this corner, and I want to have a surface to attach my paneling, my interior magnesium panel uh, or my drywall to, which is why you put it this way. I did not understand that when we first get, got started. I thought that a lot of the framers who were telling me to, oh, you want to frame a wall this way, just didn't understand, I want more insulation. I don't want that much wood. But it's not for structural stuff. It's for the attachment of the interior sheathing. So all that stuff is kind of interesting because you have conversations with people in the building industry and you'll get a lot of different answers. And it's because we all have different priorities, what exactly you're constraining yourself to and what your goal is. And so if your goal is control over the physics and chemistry, here is a little primer for how to do that. I hope that you have learned something from this. We certainly have. Please stay tuned to our Atlanta Homestead uh, playlist. Like, comment, subscribe. Tune in next time.